Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fireside Chats with the Library Company of Philadelphia. I'm Emily Guthrie, librarian for the Library Company, and I am super excited to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Rachel Walker. Rachel is an assistant professor of history at the University of Hartford, where she teaches courses on race, gender, and sexuality in America. She joins us tonight to talk about her very first book, Beauty in the Brain, The Science of Human Nature in Early America, which was published by the University of Chicago Press just last year. The book explores the intertwined history of science, beauty, and power in early America, and has been very well received. It was the winner of the Mary Kelly Best Book Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, and it was also a finalist for the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize, sponsored by the Organization of American Historians. Rachel's work has been generously supported by numerous archives and institutions, including the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Antiquarian Society, the American Philosophical Society, and our very own Library Company of Philadelphia. Rachel, we are so glad that you are able to join us tonight, and I'd be pleased for you to take it away. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone um, here for attending and also um, thanking the library company, especially Emily and Allison, who have done so much work to um, organize this talk and, and for inviting me in the first place. I also feel like I have to say how grateful I am to the Library Company of Philadelphia generally um, for supporting the research that allowed me to publish this book in the first place. The Library Company was the very, I think, my very first fellowship. So when I was a graduate student, a baby graduate student way back in like 2014, 2015, the library company gave me a semester long fellowship. And that was like the first time that I ever really got to dig into the archives. So in addition to that, the library company provided all of these manuscripts and rare books and periodicals that basically comprise the source base um, for my project. And in addition to that, um, uh, I spent so many months at the library company, even when I was no longer a fellow, I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia. Um, and as I was in Philadelphia, I was always <laughs> kind of circling in and around the library company. Um, and so I was able to develop an intellectual community there and in Philly more generally um, of scholars and of uh, archivists and librarians um, who have all provided support for this project for the past, what, like eight years at this point. Um, so thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint. Um, as Emily mentioned, my book's title is Beauty in the Brain, the Science of Human Nature in Early America. Uh, and so this is a book that's essentially about the early history of psychology in the United States. Um, but it's a history of psychology before the formal discipline of psychology actually existed. Um, so instead, it focuses on these two disciplines that were once enormously popular, but have now been discredited, um, which are physiognomy and phrenology. If you're an early American historian, then you probably maybe have heard of these disciplines, probably more likely to have heard of phrenology than physiognomy. Um, but if not, uh, you're probably wondering, like, what are physiognomy and phrenology? Uh, so physiognomy is a, oh, sorry. <laughs> So physiognomy is a science that was enormously popular in the latter decades of the 18th century. It's actually a discipline that roots way back to the ancient Greeks, um, but it's a discipline that's based on a deceptively simple idea. The idea that a person's facial features can reveal something about their intelligence, their character, and their personality. So it's essentially the idea that I could just look at you and by analyzing the shape of your forehead, the pointiness of your nose, how much flesh is on your cheeks, the size of your lips. I can tell whether or not you're a generous human being or if you are likely to steal from me or if you're going to make a good mother or um, if you're potentially stingy, right? Um, so a physiognomy, it's it, it kind of an art that stretches back um, for hundreds of years. But in the 1770s, there's a Swiss reverend, Johann Caspar Lavater, who publishes this four-volume treatise. Uh, and in this treatise, he argues that physiognomy doesn't just have to be an art 
art. It doesn't have to be um, this kind of vague process that people use to evaluate people's appearances. It could actually be a science and that you could evaluate people's personalities with almost mathematical certainty. So he publishes these um, treatises in the 1770s. And shortly after that, they become bestsellers all throughout the world. They're quickly translated into multiple languages. And in the 1790s, they become particularly popular in the United States. Phrenology follows soon after. It's a science that's created in the uh, early decades of the 19th century. Uh, phrenologists, they kind of take for granted the assumptions of the physiognomist, which is the idea that your facial features reveal something about your internal nature. But they decide that the physiognomist had not been scientific enough and that they were going to make physiognomy more scientific. And so what the phrenologists do is they say like, in fact, we can't just study the face. We also have to study the brain because after all, the brain is what they call the organ of the mind. And if you don't understand the brain, then you're not gonna understand human behavior and personality. Um, and so what the phrenologists do is they kind of divide the brain into all these various parts. They say the front part of your head is where your intellectual capacities reside. Um, and that's why if you've ever heard the phrase highbrow, lowbrow, um, the phrenologists and the physiognomists are really the people that popularize that phrase uh, early early on because they argue that because your intellect is in your forehead or in, at least in the front part of your brain, then your forehead reveals how smart you are. And the larger your forehead, <laughs> the smarter you are. So if you have a high brow, they use brow and forehead kind of interchangeably at this time. Um, if you have a high brow, then that means you're smart, you're refined um, and you're sophisticated. But if you have a low brow, then that means that you are, uh, you have, it's kind of like an external symbol of your degraded mind. The phrenologists also argued that the top part of your brain on the top of your head, that's where your moral and spiritual characteristics resided, whereas in the back and side parts of your brain, that's where your animal propensities re resided. So um, in the back of your head, for instance, they were like, that's where you'll be able to tell if you'll be a good parent. Um, in the back and side of your heads, that will reveal like how ravenous you are as an eater. Um, and they also argue that the, the kind of lump at the back of your neck will reveal your sex drive or your libido. So phrenologists are trying to come up with this comprehensive system for how to analyze human personality. Um, and they're doing it by trying to say that different parts of the brain correspond with different parts of, um, of your character. So these sciences, Become, begin to become enormously popular in the early decades of the 19th century. And they become popular because they promised to demystify human psychology and behavior. They suggested that a person's internal worth was not just measurable, but also visible on the human body. And if it was visible, then that meant that you could read a person's head, face, or personality as easily as you could read a book. We have since largely forgotten about these sciences, or if we remember them, we often remember them as kind of like quirky and misguided pseudosciences. And we talk about them with really dismissive tones. We're like, oh, like, can you believe that people in the past believe something so stupid? Like, how can you, can you imagine a world in which you legitimately think that you can go and like feel someone's skull and, and determine how smart they are or how generous they are or how kind they are? Um, and so we kind of dismiss them. Um, but in this project, I argue that we actually need to take these sciences seriously. And I don't think that we need to take them seriously because because I actually believe that they are accurate ways of analyzing human character and personality. Um, but I think we have to take them seriously because early Americans did. And early Americans thought that these sciences were legitimate ways of analyzing human nature. Um, so if we want to understand the cultural and intellectual universe of the people that we're studying, um, then we have to take these disciplines seriously not just as sciences, but as social practices and intellectual philosophies as well. You've probably noticed that when I'm talking about physiognomy and phrenology, I'm using the word science rather than pseudoscience. And you might be wondering why. Um, after all, phrenology especially is typically associated um, with 
being a pseudoscience and, and in fact is seen as the quintessential example of a pseudoscience. Um, I have this image here, which you can see is very similar to my own image of, of phrenology. Um, this image was used as the book cover for a book about pseudoscience. And the subtitle of that book was The Conspiracy Against Science, right? So there's this idea that like pseudoscience is bad, pseudoscience is not rational, pseudoscience is not real. And science, by contract, is objective and rational um, and, and a proper way of understanding the world. Now, again, I want to reiterate that I don't actually think that physiognomy and phrenology are legitimate like disciplines for understanding human behavior and character and personality, but I still refer to them as sciences. Um, and I do that because I think that referring to physiognomy and phrenology as pseudosciences, it often just kind of makes us feel good because it makes us feel smarter and better and more intellectually sophisticated than the people that were studying in the past. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of a way of just burnishing our own egos and making ourselves feel good while making people in the past seem like they're somehow intellectual dullards um, who didn't really understand the world. I think it's important to use the term science because early Americans believed that physiognomy and phrenology were sciences. Um, and so we can't kind of retroactively classify them as pseudosciences, because if we do that, then we're misrepresenting the intellectual world that they actually lived in. Um, so throughout my book and throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring to physiognomy and phrenology as sciences, um, because I think that that's, um, that's important to do. It's one of the major goals of my project to help us rethink what actually counted as science in early America. Um, and as you'll see, as this talk goes on, I also wanted to use this book to not just rethink what counted as science, but to also rethink who we can classify as a scientist. Another big goal of this book um, is to answer a big question that has plagued early American historians and American historians generally for decades. And that's the question of how Americans made sense of inequality, even as they were living in a country where technically it wasn't supposed to exist. Um, and also how they did science, how they used science to do so. The United States is supposed to be this country that is dedicated to liberty, justice, and equality for all. Um, in our Declaration of Independence, we say that everyone's entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and yet, this is, and always has been, a very unequal country since the founding. And so a lot of historians have kind of puzzled over this. They're like, how do people square that circle? How do they make sense of the fact that they live in a country that is very um, explicitly dedicated to equality? even as the country is built on slavery and sexism and inequality. How do people make that make sense to themselves in their head? Um, and so I've tried to answer that question through the history of science. In particular, I've tried to show how people use physiognomy and phrenology to rationalize inequality by saying that some people's brains and bodies are just better than other people's brains and bodies. And if those brains and bodies are better, then that means that certain people are kind of destined to be more equal than others. Um, so for instance, in this book, I show in the first chapter how early Americans would hold up the visages and the heads of people like George Washington or Benjamin Franklin. These are cuts um, that were published in the Columbian Magazine, but they're actually taken from um, Lavater's treatises on physiognomy. Um, so I show in this book how people hold up people like um, George Washington or Ben Franklin and say like, look at these superior specimens of humanity. Look at these people who are um, smart and intelligent and virtuous. These are proper examples of Republican manhood. They're people whose literal bodies reveal that they're excellent and suited for greatness and that they can lead our country in this kind of heroic experiment of nation building. Um, these people quite literally embody characteristics like virtue and intelligence and benevolence and leadership and disinterested virtue. Uh, and so in that first chapter, I show how people use, how Americans used physiognomy and phrenology to make inequality make sense by saying like, 
well, yeah, of course, some people have more resources and some people have more political um, uh, power, but that's because they're just better. They're innately superior to others. So on the one hand, I think that's like a kind of basic thing, um, something that historians of, of science have been doing for years, showing how people use science um, to rationalize privilege and power and justify and enforce hierarchies of class, race, and gender. Um, but I also think that my project does something a little bit more interesting than that too. It shows how science can be both a weapon of oppression. In other words, science can be a tool that rationalizes hierarchy and inequality, um, but also how science can be a tool of liberation. Over the course of my research, I kept realizing and I kept running into examples over and over and over and over again of ordinary people, political activists, and marginalized people, um, people of color, Black intellectuals, women's rights advocates, abolitionists, who didn't reject physiognomy and phrenology, but instead embraced these disciplines. And in fact, I encountered my first example of this at the library company it was on when I was on that first fellowship. I was looking through a, um, a magazine that was published by Black intellectuals. It was the um, Anglo-African magazine. And in this magazine, I kept seeing physiognomic and phrenological depictions of Black Americans. And I'm like, why are Black Americans using this clearly racist science to describe each other and to write about each other um, and to provide these kind of like mental portraits of each other? Um, and then I realized it wasn't just Black Americans who were doing this. It was people like William Lloyd Garrison. It was people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and other women's rights activists activists and abolitionists like Lucretia Mott and the Grimke sisters um, and Abby Kelly Foster, like all of these people who are known for being progressive and for fighting for racial and gender equity, they're also embracing physiognomy and phrenology. So I wanted to know why. <laughs> why did marginalized people and social reformers embrace these disciplines? Um, because to modern observers and to me, they seemed like they were so transparently racist, sexist, and quite frankly, dangerous. Um, so what made them appealing to ordinary people and especially people who thought of themselves as radicals and reformers? Hopefully I'm gonna answer some of those questions today um, and give you a few examples. But first, I kind of wanted to give you some examples of how Americans used physiognomy and phrenology to justify discrimination. Um, and then show you some examples of why black Americans um, and black women in particular might've found these disciplines um, as encouraging and potentially liberating philosophies. So I showed you the image of um, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. But in the early decades of the 19th century, that's when phrenology really becomes enormously popular within American society. Um, and within that context, these are the two men that Americans held up as paragons of physiognomic and phrenological excellence. These were supposed to be the most attractive, the most um, impressive, and the most stunning uh, physiognomic and phrenological specimens that existed. These were Danny Webster and John C. Calhoun, who were two of the nation's most famous politicians um, in, in the middle decades of the 19th century. Um, you can kind of see here this portrait of Daniel Webster. His forehead, I mean, he did have a large head, but, but his head and his forehead are drawn to be almost comically large. Um, and Americans repeatedly held up Daniel Webster as this excellent phrenological example, a man whose forehead was so big that you couldn't help but stare his intelligence in the face. He has a very strong brow, a stunning face. And they would, they would focus on John C. Calhoun's like angular face as a way of saying um, that he was that he was uniquely firm and, and willing to fight for his belief. So Americans would repeatedly point to um, a lot of politicians, but especially these two as men who had large heads and strong features and expansive foreheads and penetrating eyes and firmness to their countenance. Um, and they would, they would use these physical descriptions to make the argument that these men were not just political leaders by accident, but that their very nature and physiology and anatomy kind of suited them for political leadership because their external bodies were indicators of, of their internal minds. 
within this context, it's probably not going to come as a surprise to you that people used physiognomy and phrenology to rationalize racism. Um, and in fact, physiognomy and phrenology serve as the foundation for scientific racism, biological determinism, and eventually eugenics. It's this idea that like white Americans are somehow anatomically and physiologically superior to black Americans. And those physiological and anatomical traits somehow indicate something about the mental capacities and moral capacities of black and white Americans. Um, the most famous way that scientists use um, physiognomic ideas is through the facial angle. So um, Petrus Camper is, um, is a European scientist who um, argues that you can actually measure someone's intelligence by drawing a, a vertical line down from the forehead through the lips, and then a horizontal line through the ear and nose. And once you draw that line, you can simply measure the angle. And the closer you are to 90 degrees, the smarter you are and the closer you are or and the further away the smaller you go um the the less intelligent you are white scientific practitioners would regularly measure the facial angle as a way of arguing that white americans had facial angles that approached 90 degrees whereas black americans had facial angles that approached 70 or 80 degrees and as a result they would use the facial angle to argue that african americans were somehow inferior not just physically but also mentally to white americans americans also used physiognomy and phrenology to justify ethnic discrimination this is um these are images from a physiognomical manual um, that was originally published in 1866 but kind of built on ideas that had been circulating long before that in this image they compare florence nightingale who's a british reformer and nurse um to a fictional woman called bridget mcbruiser uh who is just kind of like this stereotype that's meant to stand in for all Irish women. Whenever I show this to my students, they often point out that Bridget McBruiser looks a little bit like the Grinch who stole Christmas. Um, and that's intentional. They're, um, they're arguing these images come with physical descriptions. Um, and in the physical description, the phrenologists and physiognomists argue that Bridget McBruiser um, lives in the basement mentally as well as bodily. That's um, what they say about her. And so they argue that her forehead, her nose, her lips, her teeth, her head, the shape of her cranium, all of these things reveal the inferiority of her and by extension um, all Irish Americans. Phrenologists and physiognomists also use science to draw distinctions between men and women um, and to defend the idea that there are natural distinctions between the sexes and that existing gender hierarchies were the result of mental and physical differences between men and women. Um, so in this image right here, uh, they say, this is like from the, the late 19th century, but it, I just picked it because it's kind of so, um, it, it's just a better image than some of the ones uh, that, that appear earlier in the century. But it's the same idea. They argue that domestic women, which is the ideal woman, the ideal wife and mother, have rounded faces and short foreheads and large back heads. Um, whereas women who were unruly or uh, selfish or repellent, they would have pointy features um, and they would have flat back heads and they would often have tall foreheads um, or they would pretend to have tall foreheads because they wanted to look intelligent. They wanted to exhibit um, what they complained were manly brows. Um, so there's this idea that like you can actually tell who is going to make a good wife and mother simply by analyzing someone's face. And yet it wasn't just the privileged and the powerful who are using these sciences. <laughs> I think it's quite obvious at this point that these sciences are used to reinforce racism, to reinforce uh, ethnic discrimination, and to propagate sexism. Um, and yet again, I kept finding all these examples of Black Americans, of women's rights activists, of abolitionists who are using these sciences for their own purposes. These reformers did not see physiognomy and phrenology as dangerous disciplines that reinforced existing inequalities. They saw them as sciences that might scientifically support or at least not hinder their struggle for racial justice and gender equity. So like, the big question throughout this book is just why, right? Like, why are all these people who you would think they would reject these sciences? Why are they instead embracing them? I've come up with a few reasons, but I think one of the reasons is just that like, Americans do value and have historically valued 
science as this sort of objective way of um, of demonstrating um, what they believe to be true about the world, and also this this way of demonstrating their own intellect and refinement. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, for instance, views physiognomy and phrenology as rational sciences and as exciting sciences that might eventually prove the intellectual equality of the sexes. But she also views phrenology in particular as a science that demonstrates how smart she is. When she's describing uh, her relationship with phrenology, she starts by saying that she initially was kind of trapped in in this um, in the mire of what she calls religious fatalism. And she's like, um, she is kind of depressed by religion and she can't really understand uh, what's going on with religion. And, and, and she is feeling like she's kind of trapped by that intellectual philosophy. And then she explains this um, this event where her brother, uh, her brother-in-law, kind of gives her a phrenological manual, and together the family reads phrenological manuals. And she describes this as a process of scientific enlightenment. She said that phrenology, in particular, showed her a way out of the darkness into the clear sunlight of truth. My religious superstitions gave place to rational ideas based on scientific facts. And in proportion, as I looked at everything from a new standpoint, I grew more and more happy day by day. So for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, phrenology is a science and science is a way of overcoming the superstition of religion and showing her own rationality. But I think part of the reason why Elizabeth Cady Stanton loves phrenology so much is because she gets her own head examined and the phrenologist tells her that she is rational and serious and intellectual and that she has a very masculine brain. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton certainly knows that there are problems with phrenology and she does complain. She's like, why is it that phrenologists, whenever they encounter a woman like me, a woman who is smart and refined, they always say that I have a masculine brain. Whereas when they encounter a man who is not particularly smart, they say he has a feminine brain. She's like, can't I just have a brain and can't my brain just reveal my intellect? Even so, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she views phrenology as this really exciting and rational science that might eventually help prove that the um, that men and women are intellectual equals. So she sees phrenology as an aid to the women's rights movement, uh, opposed to something that is going to hinder it. Another person uh, who kind of embraces or at least flirts with physiology ideas is Frederick Douglass. Um, and he does this because he knows that at this time, white artists and scientists alike are using art and science to provide prejudicial images of Black Americans. He says very directly in 1841, Negroes can never have impartial portraits at the hands of white artists. In other words, he says that white artists are always going to draw black Americans as having high cheekbones, distended nostril, depressed nose, thick lips, and retreating foreheads. Now, at first, those just look like a list of physical characteristics. Um, but when you read closely, you realize that Frederick Douglass is angry at white artists for portraying black Americans with retreating foreheads. Because when they portray black Americans with retreating foreheads, they're saying that they have smaller facial angles and that they're not as intelligent as white Americans. So another Douglas knows that white artists, that white scientists, and that the American population more generally is using physiognomy and phrenology to evaluate portraits. And because they're using physiognomy and phrenology to evaluate portraits, he thinks that what we need to do is just portray images of Black Americans who exhibit the signs of anatomical and physiological and thus mental excellence. And so Frederick Douglass makes the argument, even though he knows that physiognomy and phrenology could be problematic for Black Americans, he makes the argument that what white or what Black Americans need to do is they need to paint or, or they need to sit for, for portraits. Um, he wants more portraits of people like Martin Delaney um, and William Still and William Wells Brown uh, and James McCune Smith. These are all black intellectuals. And he said, white artists never portray these men because these are men who have faces that indicate their intellectual eminence. 
Travis, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, also thinks that he has a great head and face. Um, and as a result, he views portraiture as a sort of way of combating white racial science. He's like, I am going to show, I'm going to use the, the image of my own face as a way of showing people that Black Americans can be attractive and intelligent. He views photography as, as especially powerful because if you're getting your portrait painted by a white artist, they can always distort your features. But he thinks of photography as, as an almost like truer art form. And Frederick Douglass, in addition to, to putting a lot of faith in photography, he also thinks that images are going to do um, a lot more convincing than, than argumentation. Like he's like, we're not gonna convince white Americans with words that black Americans are equal. We can show them that we are intellectually equal by posing for photographs. Um, and he kind of refers to this idea 20 years later um, when he talks about how reason and argument aren't going to convince people um, because you have to appeal to people's emotions. Um, and so he says, the mighty fortress of the human heart silently withstands the assaults by the rifled cannons of reason. Dry logic and elaborate arguments, though perfect in all their appointments, and though knitted together as a coat of mail, lay down the law to empty benches. Basically, you're preaching to an empty church. Um, but he who speaks to the feelings, who enters the soul's deepest meditations, holding the mirror up to nature, revealing the profoundest mysteries of the human heart to the eye and ear by action and by utterance, will never want for an audience." So in a way, he says, what we need to do is not appeal to people's brains. We need to appeal to people's hearts. And images are a way to do that. And so as a result, because he thinks that he has a particularly refined countenance, he becomes the most photographed man of the 19th century. So I guess this comes back to the bigger question, right? Like, why did activists and marginalized Americans embrace these sciences? And how did they use them to their own advantage? On the one hand, um, I think that they embrace these sciences simply because of the simple fact that a lot of American phrenologists, despite the very racist and sexist things that they published, they actually politically tended to oppose slavery and support women's rights. So America's most powerful phrenologists at this time, they in fact published all of these articles about how the women's rights movement and women's suffrage is a noble crusade. They publish all of these flattering um, analyses of the heads of people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, and the people who are running America's biggest phrenological um, workshop and, and publishing company, um, they will often forge political connections with women's rights activists and abolitionists. Um, so in the background here, this is a letter from one of the managers at the um, American Phrenological Journal. And he's writing to um, John Brown's son, and he's basically not only lauding the memory of John Brown, um, but in addition to that, he's telling John Brown Jr. to not let the pro-slavery sharks get him. So these are people whose sympathies politically are anti-slavery and pro-women's rights, despite all of the problematic things they say. Um, Phrenology in particular also becomes especially appealing to progressive activists because this is a time when other white scientists like craniometrists and ethnologists, they are increasingly arguing that you are born into a particular brain and you are born in a particular body and that you, there is nothing that you can do to change that brain or to change that body. And simply by measuring your skull shape, we can determine how smart you are. The phrenologists, by contrast, actually are forwarding a much more flexible interpretation of the human mind and the body. They argue ultimately that regardless of your race and regardless of your gender, all human brains are more similar than different. So they make the argument for the universal equality of all human brains. And they say that like everyone's brain is gonna be a little bit different because you're gonna have a different combination of phrenological organs. But at the end of the day, like all human beings, regardless of race or gender, we all have the same organs. The phrenologists also interestingly emphasize the human capacity for self-betterment. So whereas craniometrists and ethnologists are saying that like you're born into a brain, skull and body and there's nothing that you can do to change it, the phrenologists argue that you can actually change the shape of your skull by working on certain parts of your character or personality. So if you wanna be smarter, you should study a lot. That's gonna make the front part of your brain bigger and more powerful. And it's gonna quite literally push on your skull from the inside out to make you more beautiful in the process. This gives activists the, mes the message that every human being is capable of being better than they were yesterday. Um, and as a result, it's kind of a, 
an encouraging message that like we can all improve and that like even if things aren't equal now um, then they might be equal in the future. But I think the most important thing is that physiognomy and phrenology are just ubiquitous and accessible. This was a time when colleges and medical schools were generally inaccessible for women um, and physiognomy and phrenology for women and, and Black Americans. Um, and physiognomy and phrenology could be accessed in a variety of venues. That could be in people's homes or on the streets or in public lectures, in personalized readings. Like you could go and get, you could go into a phrenological workshop and get your head examined. Um, you could access physiognomy and phrenology at dinner parties, um, and you could read about them in, in pretty much any newspaper, magazine, or novel. So physiognomy and phrenology are essentially everywhere, and this makes them accessible even to people that you wouldn't that wouldn't necessarily have access to um, higher education at the time. I want to give you this one example um, to end because I think that this is really powerful. So I found the um, the journals of. Mary Virginia Montgomery, who was a black woman that um, was born into slavery um, and actually belonged to um, the brother of the president of the Confederacy. But she was um, really well educated. Her parents made sure that she was um, had access to magazine subscriptions and scientific literature. Um, and so she was reading things like Plutarch or Darwin. But what interested me is that she's not just reading Darwin or Plutarch, she's reading uh, the American Phrenological Journal. She has a subscription to the American Phrenological Journal and she also owns her own phrenological bust. And so eventually Mary Virginia Montgomery not only gains her freedom, um, but she also is accepted to Oberlin College. Um, and so she's one of the only black um, American, like one of the very few black Americans who are getting a college education um, in, in the 19th century. And when she goes to Oberlin, she brings her phrenological journal with her. Um, and when she's on the ship, she complains about some of the, the racism and discrimination that she faces when she's on the boat. Um, but then she says that she ends up having a better time and that she tries to entertain phrenologically by reading people's head, um, by reading people's heads and practicing her own phrenological skills. Um, and she says that she didn't feel homesick so much um, when, when she was able to do that. So this is interesting to me because Mary Virginia Montgomery, she clearly sees phrenological, uh, phrenology as a discipline that's amusing, but also as a discipline that's instructive. Um, and it's something that she's reading alongside something like Darwin's Origin of Species, which we now consider to be one of the most foundational scientific texts of all time. But my question is like, why would a young black woman find phrenology appealing? <laughs> um, and part of that answer, I think, is that she sees examples of other black intellectuals who are using physiognomy and phrenology to argue for the power of human science. So this is what I encountered actually at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, and, it's, and it's a physical description of Phyllis Wheatley, who is the famous black poet. In the, um, in the uh, magazine, they describe Phyllis Wheatley as having a facial angle of 90 degrees, a finely formed forehead, a large brain, um, and a long nose with thin nostrils and the eyes, though not large, are well set. Um, so these initially might just seem like random physical descriptions, but if you know the physiognomic and phrenological language of the day, you know that like they're pointing to her 90 degree for, uh, forehead angle to very specifically make an argument for Phyllis Wheatley's intelligence. They're saying like, she has a large brain and a finely formed forehead that's 90 degrees. Those are the physiognomic and phrenological standards that are usually only applied to white people. So here you see a black author using a physical description of a woman in order to prove the resilience. This black author also argues that the whole makeup of this space is an index of healthy intellectual powers combined with an active temperament over which has fallen a slight tinge of religious pensiveness. Thus hangs Phyllis Wheatley before you in the African American Picture Gallery. Now this African American Picture Gallery didn't actually exist in person. It wasn't an actual picture gallery. It was just a series of words. They kind of guided you through um, a, a fictional uh, picture gallery that didn't really exist but they used detailed physical descriptions to make an argument for the power of Phyllis Wheatley's mind. And so it's entirely possible that Mary Virginia Montgomery read something like this. It's also entirely possible um, that Mary Virginia Montgomery was just reading in her American Phrenological Journal and finding examples of the American Phrenological describing black women as um, having unusual intellectual powers. 
I want to be clear that the American Phrenological Journal did describe Black women as being intellectually inferior for the most part, and Black Americans generally as being intellectually inferior. Um, but they did occasionally publish flattering profiles of Black Americans. And this is one example. This is a woman, um, Sarah Margrew Kinson Green, who was on the famous ship, the Amistad. Um, and the American Phrenological described her as having a broad and high forehead that was particularly prominent in the center and a large head sustained by a vigorous constitution. Those were all physiognomic and phrenological indicators of mental excellence. At the same time, the American Phrenological Journal, unlike the uh, Anglo-African mag uh, magazine, Anglo African magazine um, kind of provided mixed messages. Um, they emphasized Margrew's superior brain, um, but they also said, but of course she's far superior to Africans generally. So essentially they hold her up as this exception that proves their racist rule. That said, someone like Mary Virginia Montgomery is a black woman who now has multiple examples of phrenologists or people who are sympathetic to phrenology and physiognomy describing black women as intellectual models. Um, so it's not hard for me to necessarily see um, why someone like Mary Virginia Montgomery might like phrenology or, or find it to be a useful, liberating and potentially subversive science. Now, of course, <laughs> there were risks with this approach. When progressive activists and marginalized people embraced physiognomy and phrenology, they often ended up validating the idea that external beauty was a sign of internal worth. Um, and they essentially conceded that human value could be determined by scientific study. Like you can actually tell how good someone is by scientifically studying their body. And when you do that, you sort of lend credence to discriminatory ideas that end up laying the scientific foundation for discrimination and political exclusion. Um, but I think that it's nonetheless important to recover the history of these sciences um, because it reminds us that science can simultaneously function as both a weapon of oppression and a tool of liberation. Um, and it's a tool that marginalized people and radical activists can use to fight for racial justice and gender equality. I think this history is also important because it reminds us that the intellectual universe of the early Republic was complex and it was contradictory and it was full of experimentation and argumentation and vibrant debate. Um, and most importantly, within this context, white men are not the only people who are producing scientific knowledge. Finally, I think that if we don't take physiognomy and phrenology seriously, then we're simply not going to be able to understand the people that we're studying um, because we're not going to understand how they understood concepts like race or gender or beauty or intelligence um, or how they made those kind of abstract concepts feel real on the ground. I think the history of physiognomy and phrenology is ultimately so significant because it forces us to adopt a posture of intellectual humility. We can't just denounce people in the past. <laughs> It'd be really easy to look back at these now discarded disciplines and denounce them as absurd or humorous or dangerous, um, or as examples of pseudoscientific quackery. It could make us feel smarter and more thoughtful and more scientifically advanced than our predecessors. But I think ultimately that scoffing at disciplines like physiognomy and phrenology is just a way of making ourselves feel good. And I don't think that that's a particularly useful exercise because the job of a historian is to recover lost worlds and, and then sit in those worlds and recapture their contours and try to make people understand what it was like to live in a different era. Um, and I know that's a difficult pursuit sometimes, um, but I also think it's a useful pursuit because it reminds us that there are all these cultural beliefs and moral values and scientific practices that seem alien to us, but weren't alien at all in the past. Um, so obviously I'm biased, but I think subjects like this are exciting because they remind me to be humble. Um, and they remind me that the definition of science is always changing uh, and that culture is always changing and that all of those things that we think of as natural and normal and obvious and like, of course, um, all of those things were different in the past. And that means that they can be different in the future too. Um, but in the end, it just reminds me to be intellectually humble. Um, and on that note, I just want to say that I'm, I'm humbled by all of your interest in my project. I'm so glad that you came out um, to listen to my talk tonight. So grateful to the library company for inviting me here and I'm happy to answer your questions. So thanks again. Rachel, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was wonderful. Thank you for all the
the energy and excitement you brought to that and all of the really great, great images too. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we welcome our audience to submit questions either in the chat or in the Q&A feature. Um, so, you know, we, we welcome any question you might have. Um, and while we're waiting for people to, to put those in the chat, um, I could go ahead and get started with a question of my own. So um, I feel like I'm kind of curious about kind of modern day uh, parallels to the practices that, that you are studying of physiognomy and, and phrenology. And we do all sorts of things to change our physical appearances in ways that we think will make us more um, appear more beautiful or more intelligent to others. Everything from, you know, contouring makeup to fake glasses or plastic yeah. surgery. <laughs> And so I'm kind of wondering what you found about, was there any evidence of people actually physically altering their, their heads, you know, through pinning their ears back or, you know, finding ways to enlarge their forehead? I know you said something about um, uh, hairstyles that would, you know, make your forehead look a certain way. What other kinds of um, physical changes did, did people make to themselves, if, if any. Yeah, so I was really interested. So I, I started seeing, especially in the 1840s and 50s, there were these um, public debates where uh, male authors began railing against women who they said, like intellectual women in blue stockings, like women who are trying to make themselves look more intelligent than they are. Um, they were railing against them for, uh, cutting the top of their hair, like um, kind of like shaving the top of their hairlines to make their foreheads look larger um, because they wanted to appear smarter to the general population. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. But then I kept seeing it and I was like, huh, I wonder if this is actually happening. And so I started actually at the library company uh, pretty recently. Um, I started just like going through all of these beauty manuals um, and I began realizing. So in the 19th century, I don't know if anyone spends as much time as you probably do looking at like 19th century portraits, but um, in, in the 1840s and 50s, there's this shift in hairstyle. So in the 1820s, there's like a lot of um, kind of curling around the forehead. Like they, yeah. they put a lot of like curls around the forehead. And then in the 1830s, that starts to disappear. And instead they just part the hair down the center of the head and kind of slick it back. And then there's sure. just like, yeah. like very unflattering bun at the back of the head. And so I'm like, interesting. <laughs> So in all these beauty ma manuals, I started seeing references that if you as if you kind of like eliminated the look of your hair, um, if you parted it in the center and kind of like pulled it back, then you could emphasize the natural shape of your cranium and allow people to see kind of your phrenological endowments, um, which I thought was interesting. But then what I thought was really interesting was I found all of these newspaper ads for products that would actually, they're kind of like, like early American waxing products that would take hair off of moles and other parts of your body. But also they, they specifically advertised that they could take hair off the top of your forehead to give you an intellectual forehead. And they're actually citing in these advertisements for these beauty products, they're actually citing the sciences of physiognomy and phrenology and referring to famous physiognomists and phrenologists. Um, so I have no sense of like how often people are actually buying those products, um, yeah. but that it's like they're being advertised over and over and over and over again for decades uh, in the middle decades of the 19th century. I'm like, okay, so clearly people are are thinking of their own appearance in terms in terms of these sciences. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Oh, that sure does. That's fascinating. It gives me some uh, yeah. <laughs> ideas for a Halloween costume to be a perfect chronological specimen. <laughs> it also makes me think think about portraits differently. And I'm thinking of ones that I've seen, you know, where um, the person is very deliberately turned and in, in, seen in profile. Uh, Yes. Oh, okay. So here's this other thing. I looked when I was at the National Portrait Gallery, I was looking through the papers of Hiram Powers, who's that famous 19th century sculptor. Um, and he was a, a big phrenologist. Um, and so he has letters back and forth with some of his clients. And he kind of says directly that he's going to emphasize certain phrenological traits in the sculptures. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and in, of sorts. 
<laughs> he changes he changes the woman's hairstyle from what she normally wears and sculpts her in a different sort of hairstyle because he thinks it'll better like illustrate her phrenological endowment. So yeah, that yeah. that was really fascinating as well. Huh. We have a question uh, from Fran Kitching who asks a very good question. When did people stop believing in these sciences and why do you what do you think made them stop? Yeah, I mean, well, I guess the answer to that is complicated. First of all, so I would say the easy answer is like 1860s, 1870s ish. They are really kind of, they've really gone out of fashion, but they never quite disappear entirely. So I have, so for instance, like Mary Virginia Montgomery, she's still reading the American Phrenological Journal in the 1870s, and she still has a phrenological bust in the 1870s, and she's still practicing the science. So for her, like phrenology has not gone out of style. And I have other women's diaries that they're still using phrenology in the 1880s. So like, I'd say culturally, it kind of goes out in the 1860s and 70s. Among elite scientific thinkers, it kind of goes out of style a little earlier, um, but again, it doesn't really go away. So for instance, ethnologists or craniometrists, they're making the argument that the phrenologists were simply not scientific enough um, and that they actually have a more quantitative and more scientific way of measuring human mental capacity. So mm. instead of the phrenologists, which are analyzing kind of like the various bumps on the head, the craniometrists are saying like, we need to take empty skulls and fill them with various substances and measure how much they can hold. Mm. And that gives, you, that gives you a very clear number, right? It's like yeah. this skull can hold this much lead shot or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so they say like phrenology, we're more scientific than phrenology. We're more quantitative than phrenology, but they use all of the same assumptions of the physiognomist and the phrenologist. Like they too believe that a retreating forehead indicates intellectual inferiority, right? So it's like they're simultaneously building on the work of the scientists who come before them, even as they're trying to prove that they are better and smarter and more rational. Um, hmm. And in some ways, I actually think like craniometry is much more harmful than phrenology, because at least phrenology <laughs> argues that like everyone's brain is unique and like everyone has the same mental organs, but craniometrists are, are, are making very clear kind of racial distinctions. Yeah. Um, so the answer is like, it goes away, but never fully goes away. Yeah. Yeah. lingering and lingering there somewhere in the shadows yeah. yeah interesting okay um looks like we have another one um this one is from one of our, our current fellows lauren clausen and lauren asks just this week she says just this week i ran into a marriage manual at the library company regarding choosing a husband or wife based on phrenological characteristics do you know if this was widespread or common? So my uh, short answer is that there is, I don't know if you know the work of Carla Biddle, but um, she's a historian of science who actually has her, her book should, I think should be coming out within the next few months. And she has a whole chapter on this. Um, I would have totally written about this more if I didn't, you know, I've been like kind of corresponding with Carla for the past few years. Um, and so I knew she was working on it. So I just, you know, I had like other things um, that I was doing, but her chapter is so fascinating because there's a whole um, in the water cure journal because um, phrenologists are also associated with water cure. Um, so the water cure journal is run by phrenologists and they have a whole section that's called, if I'm remembering correctly, matrimonial correspondence, where people could literally write in to the Water Cure Journal and be like, I am a man of strong amativeness and I have large intellectual organs and small animal propensities. I'm like, I, you know, like it kind of like, it was like dating, you know, like online dating, but like in 19th century magazines. Um, so you could like give your phrenological characteristics and then indicate what phrenological characteristics you were looking for and a partner. Um, I don't know how many, and I don't think Carla knows either because it's like kind of impossible to tell. I don't know how many of these were like actually people who were writing into the magazine and how many of them are just people like that are created by the editors. Right. Um, so, you, you know, so it, it's like kind of hard to tell. Um, but she has a, a really great chapter on that. I don't know the title of her forthcoming book, but it should be coming out soon. So keep that um, on your radar. But also, yeah, I mean, I've seen this in various other places that are not phrenological journals. It's like even in, um, oh, so even think of like um, like Jane Eyre. Um, she has this whole section where she analyzes um, Mr. Rochester's forehead. 
Um, and, you know, tries to discern if he <laughs> is trustworthy or, you know, whatever, based on the analysis of his forehead. And that is something like it's, I said Jane Eyre, but like you could pick up pretty much any 19th century novel. And once you know what you're looking for, you're like, oh, oh every character is yeah. is described using this language. So I'd argue it's like, it's just a, a totally widespread way of, of analyzing character and personality um, and appearance that we've just kind of forgotten about. And so we read through it carefully, like we, we, we read through it quickly now, but if you know what you're looking for, you're like, this is, this is everywhere in 19th century. It shows up everywhere. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating. Um, are you okay with another question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, this is interesting. Uh, Eileen Monis asks, well, did these really ever go away as the Nazis were using similar measurements? Yeah, um, and that's what I meant earlier when like someone was like, huh, when did this go away? And I was like, well, 1860s, but never. Um, I think every generation of scientists post the phrenologist, they try to say, you know, we're actually much more scientific than the phrenologist. And they're like, oh, the phrenologist, just they didn't really know how to measure um and so like every generation of scientists they just use different metrics especially when you have like the rise of anthropology um especially at the beginning of the the late 19th and early 20th centuries they use a lot of the same phrenological characteristics that are used earlier in the century they just don't call it phrenology um and yeah the nazis are using physiognomy they're measuring facial shapes they're um they're talking about shifty eyes in the same way that you would in like 1830 you know um and they're using a lot of the tropes that show up earlier in the century i would say it even extends beyond the nazis like there are currently data science okay so this is i'll give an example this is one of the papers that i found that was like quite horrifying as i was looking for like modern manifestations of physiognomy and phrenology so there are um people who measure the width of um hockey players heads and then measure like how many penalties they get in hockey games in an attempt to prove that a higher facial width to height ratio, which is what they call it now in the literature, is indicated, uh, indicates higher levels of aggressiveness. So like there are people who are like still doing physiognomic analysis just in a slightly different way in papers that were published, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, there's another example of scholars who are using data science. They download a bunch of pictures from online dating profiles. And then they say like, okay, this person is like man seeking man or woman seeking woman. So they, they categorize people into either like categories of gay or straight. And then they try to use facial recognition algorithms to figure out like, what are the facial traits of a gay American? You know, so like this stuff, even though it's not really considered legitimate science, that doesn't mean that it's gone away, even in the scientific literature of today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Um, it is seven seven fifty nine. I I have I have one more question I could ask. Um, are you are you okay with one more? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's a lot of interest. Um, let's see. I, this person asks: Did you find examples of white women slash black people of all genders critiquing these sciences during this time period, or critiquing people of their own identity groups? were advancing the sciences. Yeah, so I guess I'll use the examples because these are the examples that I used of people who kind of embrace physiognomy and phrenology. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass both also critique phrenology. Um, so it's like they use it strategically and yet they also critique it. So Frederick Douglass, he complains explicitly that phrenologists are some of the people who are drawing black Americans with retreating foreheads and with facial features that supposedly indicate, you know, mental inferiority. Um, and yet, even so, so he, like, he's totally aware that phrenology is being used as a way of discriminating against black Americans. Like, how could you not be right? So he knows it's perilous to engage. Um, and yet, even so, like, he writes that of all of the white scientific practitioners, He's like, there are only two that I think have given black, um, like that have given um, black Americans, um, like at least some sort of like <laughs> a kind of positive portrayal. And those two that he writes are the natural scientist Samuel Pritchard and uh, George Coombe, who's um, one of the world's most famous phrenologists. So it's like, 
he recognizes the problems, but also sees phrenology as a kind of more ethical alternative to craniometry and ethnology and some of the other sciences circulating. But he is critiquing it too. James McCune Smith um, is also critiquing, uh, who is like a, the um, a famous black doctor. Um, he is much, much more critical of, of phrenology than, than Frederick Douglass is. Um, and so he kind of like, <laughs> he gives a, a whole lecture in 1839 about kind of what he calls, I think the title of the lecture is The Fallacy of Phrenology. Mm-hmm. Um, and then does a kind of satirical series called The Heads of the Colored People, which um, I think probably a lot of people at the library company would be familiar with in 1859. Um, so he's he's much more critical. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton too, right? Like she she uses it, she likes it. She likes that phrenologists like her and tell her that she's got a big, beautiful brain and a skull to match. Um, and yet she also complains about phrenologists who portray women as inferior. So it's like, it's not like they're just blindly embracing sciences that are forwarding their own discrimination. They know what they're doing, but they still, they still see hope. Um, in these discriminatory discourses. Yeah. Uh, well, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was that was just brilliant. And I really enjoyed oh, enjoyed hearing all about your research and your book. I haven't read it yet, but I think I'm going to now. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for sharing all of this with our audience as well. And of I course. hope you'll continue to circle back around the library company soon. Um, I will absolutely be back. I feel like I can't stay away from the library company, so I'll be back. (laughs) Glad to hear it. (laughs) Well, thanks again and have a good night and good night, everyone.